Welcome to Victory Church Craddock. Story because they had to draw, uh, do dramas for me and so I would teach them. And now I'm an Afrikaans high style teacher and I'm so happy to see Luana here. Um, because she can testify that uh, when I teach them how to write a story, she's in my grade 7 class, um, there's certain elements in a story. Now, Luana, will you please tell us what are those elements? What is the element of a story? Can you undou? So it is a begin. Middle ene. And what is the middle? Die climax. En wat gebeur in die climax? Die story van Anner. So I've got a story to tell you today about the story about man and his creator. And it's actually a very simple story, a very simple message. But the moment that I realized this, um, it made a profound impact in my relationship with the Lord. So a story to teach you has a beginning, a middle and an end. And a, um, the middle is uh, the climax, and that's where the story changes. And there's also always a protagonist and the antagonist. A protagonist is the good guy, the antagonist is the bad guy. And there's always conflict until the protagonist wins, the story changes and there's a resolution. Now if you look at creation and our story, it's the story. So let's start from the beginning. We read in Genesis 1 that God created the heavens and the earth. Now what's interesting, it, it just came into being. God didn't create you something. Um, if I understood it correctly, he spoke it into being, but he made it out of nothing. So he just created heavens and earth. Then, and everything on it, then on the fifth day, he created man. Where's the clicker? <laughs> Thank you. Which one do I press? The middle one. No, no, there we go. Then God decided on the fifth day in Genesis 1, 26 to 27, he said, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So what he did, now, in the first instance, when he created heavens and earth and all the animals, he formed it out of nothing. But when he created man, the Hebrew says that he formed man. So what he actually did is, and he did it out of the ground. So just like a potter and a clay, God took ground and with clay and he formed us. And he was intentional in how he formed us. He had specifics in each in forming the human, Adam. And so it was a lump of clay. And afterwards, he breathed, or he breathed the breath of life in his nostrils, and man became a living being. So for me, that's amazing. Because we are sometimes so unhappy with ourselves. In Psalm 139, it says that you were embroidered with various colors in your mother's womb. So when God made man, he was intentionally, and what is so wonderful, after he made man, Genesis 1.31, and God saw everything that he made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. So he made human and he thought this. And everything else he made is very good. So we, as creation of God the Father, are made very good. 
We are not allowed to curse God's creation, to curse one another. Because if we do it, the person next to you are an intentionally made creation of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Because all three of them were present when they made the heavens and the earth and when they made humans. And everybody has the breath of life. You can't live without it. God's spirit is everywhere in creation, saved or unsaved, because without it we would die. It is his breath that keeps everything on this earth going. What does it mean to be in the image of God, in the image and the likeness of God? So I studied a lot about it, and there's a lot of um, ideas what it means. I don't think that we resemble God physically. Um, I don't think so. It says in John 4, 24, I think it says that God is spirit and we've got to worship him in spirit and in truth. So I don't think we resemble him physically, although Jesus came and he looked like a human. But, but I, yeah, I've got my own theory about that. But we are, God made us into his image because his assignment to Adam was that we would take care as his representative on earth that they would look after the Garden of Eden. They had the, he had the authority. He had to give them names. So he was, um, Adam was God's representative on earth. And he gave him dominion. But we are made into the likeness of God. The likeness of God means that we can communicate with God, that we can connect with him, that we could feel that we can reason. So he made a human to fellowship with. That's why, and, and we are the only ones, humans are the only ones that have that likeness of God. So he, we would stand as God's image, his representative on earth, and we would rule and manage over the rest of his creation in his likeness and in his image. So what happened? Let's continue with Adam and Eve. So Eve was formed out of Adam, and then Genesis 2, the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I said to Stefan this morning, I wonder why I planted the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Um, and the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it as his representative, as his image on earth. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. The assignment was given to Adam not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But Adam and Eve had the ability to reason, to make decisions. You must remember when they were in the Garden of Eden, they were like in a bubble. They had no idea about evil. They had, they had all the fruit, not fruits, the fruit of the Spirit. They had God's nature. They were like him. They, they totally trusted him for everything. They lacked nothing. God gave them this beautiful garden. He gave them everything that they wanted. So there was no need for them. The moment they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, evil came in. Their eyes opened. And the scripture says the following. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. The moment they sinned, they were ashamed. Shame came in. And for me, that's wonderful. Because God walked 
and talked with them daily. They could be in their presence because they were without sin. They saw him. No one has seen God and lived. And, and um, they walked and talked with him in a daily basis. And the moment that happened, they called out to God and he said, where are you? And they said, but we are naked. And then, sorry, there's one scripture missing. I'm just going to go back. All right. Then uh, the Lord God says, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So Adam and Eve was banned out of the garden of Eden. God meant for Adam to live forever, without sickness, without blemish, perfect communication with God. And because of man's disobedience, and God's punishment, our connection with him was broken. And our reflection of him became colored. We were not in his image and likeness anymore. It was all marred, the word says, or colored. So the two trees, for me, the meaning of the two trees means the following. Until today, the two trees are important in our lives. Because evil came in, we've got, a, we've got a, and, and all the hurt we go through, and that is what Jeannie preached on last weekend. Because we go through that stuff, we look at a situation. At a, say, for instance, there's a conflict, and we look at a situation, and we look through it, at it through our own hurt, and it's not necessarily the truth. And we make a decision, and, and we judge out of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil in our heads. But there's your truth and there's my truth and then there's the truth. Well, if we hang to the, the tree of life, the tree of life means that we, and that's Jesus, is that we give the situation to him and say, Father, this has happened. I give the situation to you. Will you please help me in this? Take care of it. Counsel me. Give me. And we, we eat of the tree of life. That means we just surrender it all to him. And we do not try to work it out in our heads. And that's in all areas of our lives. Whether it is finance, whether it is, and that means to lean in and to trust the Lord in everything that we do. So why did God make man? He made man for a lot of reasons, but the, but the one thing is that he, he calls us sons and daughters in the Bible. So he wanted a family. He wanted a family and he wanted fellowship. He had a, 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 some, some people say that he had a longing for that, for family. And that's why he did so much to get us back. So the second thing, and I'm just going to show them on the slide. They're not what they're supposed to be there. They're supposed to come in one by one. So the first one is fellowship and relationship. So they must, in Genesis 3, 8, the intimate communion um, illustrates God's longing for a deep and personal relationship with his creation. That's just what I said. The second thing is to exercise dominion. So he made people to exercise dominion over, um, over the earth. The third thing is to serve and glorify God. Now these reasons are all after the fall and, and after the cross, but we are image bearers of Christ. We are supposed to walk in, uh, on this earth as his image bearers. And we are also supposed to advance his kingdom. Because God is out, remember before the fall, where we are in our story in the beginning, what he wanted was fellowship, unbroken fellowship, like in 1 John says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we will be in unbroken fellowship. Imagine you could go ask God anything and he answers you immediately. And, and that's what he wants us. He, he wants uh, the kingdom of 
heaven to be established on earth. That is our purpose. That is what he made us. So we don't really have a choice in it if we want to walk with God. The next thing is to enjoy creation. You know, um, sometimes when get, life gets stuff, um, someone used to say to us, just go and smell the roses. Just go and enjoy whatever you do. We are, he made the Garden of Eden beautiful for Adam and Eve. So he wants us to enjoy creation, to do things that are good for us. Um, not every, some things are permitted, but not all things are good for us. You all know that, eh? but in any case. So, and then to participate in redemption. That means to reconcile people back to the original design. And then one that is something all of us are looking for is to fulfill our unique calling. Ephesians 2.10 says that we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This individual calling is our God-given talents and gifts that he has given each and every single person on this earth. And the reason for it is to advance his kingdom. There's not one of us that does not have a purpose and a calling. Don't, it doesn't matter what it, how small, how big. And all of us have to be partakers in advancing the kingdom of God. And we because um, in Colossians it says, Okay. In Colossians it says, 116, For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Now, I want to put something out there. You can have the most money in the world. You can have the best cars, the best of everything. If you do not have Jesus in your life, you will have a longing in your life that will never be fulfilled. Because we were made and created into his image and his likeness. We were made for a purpose. We were not made to do our own thing. In a way, we do our own thing. And, um, and that's, I hope you understand what I'm saying. In the deepest of our core, you get all these rock stars for the younger ones and they got all the money and they got everything and then they use drugs and they and 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 we can't understand it it's because there will be a longing in us that can only be fulfilled by Jesus because we are made for him and in him and that's the short and the long of it So our story continues. So Jesus um, came and the cross happened and he died and it was resurrected and we were connected. You know that in Genesis it says that God the Father already planned after the fall of man how to rectify this thing. Um, I think in the first three chapters, somewhere there, already God decided what is he going to do to rectify it. A man was so important for him. This family that he created was so important for him that he immediately decided, what am I going to do to help? And so he sent his son. It cost him everything to get this family back. And when the cross came, Jesus walked and talked on this earth for 33 years. Now, the calling is still there for us that we have to have the nature of God in our lives, that we have to represent him here on earth. He hasn't given up on that. That's what our purpose is. And 
if we don't adhere to that, we're going to miss out on the race that we are supposed to walk in. Paul said that he finished his race. If you can go, if you can walk your walk on earth and you can say, but I've finished my race, it will be that you have fulfilled your calling in God. So Jesus came. The next slide, Jody. Next one. Okay, next one. That's the one that I was looking for. He's our creator. He's our savior. He's our Lord. We were created by him and we were created for him. Now, we've got to go back to the original design in our nature with God. So, Jesus walked on this earth. So, if I said to you, you I'm going to teach you to swim, but you've never in your life were in water swimming. And I said, okay, I'm going to draw it for you. I'm going to um, give you a diagram how you've got to use your arms and how you've got to use your feet. And then... Um, I'm going to put you in the water and you've got to swim. You're going to drown because you're not going to know how to do it. But Jesus came because it, it is expected from us to go back to the original design. So Jesus came and for 33 years he showed us how to live. If you read the red in the Bible, that's what we're supposed to do. So apart from the cross that reconciled us to the Father, he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So if you want to know how, you have to go to the Bible and you've got to go and read what Jesus did. How are we transformed into his likeness? Philippians 3, 8 to 10. Next one, Jody. All right. Now, this is an amazing scripture. You must remember Paul wrote this. Paul said, Paul did not walk with Jesus. He wasn't one of this, the disciples, um, like Peter and John and Matthew. Paul was after Jesus. So the Holy Spirit taught Paul this. And there was a stage where Paul was in the third heaven while he was on earth, where he said, I don't know where I am, if I'm here or, or if I'm not here, that's now in my own language. But that's how close Paul uh, walked with, with the Father. But the scripture in, in Philippians 3, 8 to 10 says, but more than that, I count everything as loss compared to the priceless pr privilege and supreme advantage of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord, and of growing more deeply and thoroughly acquainted with him. A joy unequaled. Now, if we want to know how to become and how to change our nature to the original design, we've got to know Jesus Christ. For his sake, I've lost everything and I consider it all garbage so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, believing and relying on him not having any righteousness of my own derived from my obedience to the law and its rituals, but possessing that genuine righteousness which come through faith in Christ, the righteousness which come from God on the basis of faith. Next one. And this, so that I may know him experientially, become more thoroughly acquainted with him, understanding the remarkable wonders of his person more completely. You guys, this is awesome. And in the same way, experience the power of his resurrection, which overflows and is active in believers, and that I may share the fellowship of his sufferings by being continually transformed inwardly into his likeness, even to his death, dying as he did, so that I may attain to the resurrection that will raise me from the death. So Paul was saying here, yeah, you know what? All I want, everything else is garbage. All I want is to know Jesus, to become like him, to know the power 
of his resurrection and also his death. And that means that we are going to go through suffering. Because we've got this thing that's got to die, this fleshly that's got a, that stands up. We are made body, soul, and spirit. And we've got a flesh where the sin nature is rampant in, and that has to die in order for us to become like Jesus. But there's good news at the end of, of, of this. So in Paul's estimation, there was nothing greater than knowing Jesus. If we can go to the next scripture, in 2 Corinthians 3.18, And we all, who with unveiled faces, contemplate the Lord's glory. Now in the Amplified it says, Because we continue to behold the Word of God. And the Word of God there is with a capital letter W. So that means Jesus and the Bible. So we continue to behold the Word of God are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory which come from the Lord who is the Spirit. There's a promise again, another one, another scripture. Next one. That regarding your previous way of life, you put off your old self, completely discard your former nature which is being corrupted through deceitful desires desires that's what happened with the fall in the spirit of uh, sorry and being continually renewed in the spirit of your mind having a fresh untarnished mental and spiritual attitude and put on the new self the generated and renewed nature created in God's image godlike in the righteousness and holiness of truth living in a way that express the God your expresses to God your gratitude for your salvation. You guys, we can become again in the image and the likeness of God. That's his plan to restore us back to where it began. And and that's our purpose. You know, you can follow all the rules. You can do a program. You can follow sermons. It all helps you. But nothing is going to get you or teach you or change you like knowing Jesus. Getting knowledge of who He is. It transforms you. The last scripture, this is a difficult scripture. This is in Peter. Um, So this is 2 Peter 1 verse 4. Simeon, Peter, a servant and apostle of Christ Jesus, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. May grace and peace. Now Amplified it says, which is perfect well-being, all necessary good, all spiritual prosperity be multiplied to you in the knowledge, the full, personal, precise, and correct knowledge, says the Amplified, of God and of Jesus our Lord. So if you read there, grace and peace, I don't know if you understand how much power there is in grace. Grace is unmerited favor, but it's not only that. There's power in the grace of God. When God's uh, grace is applied in our life, it enables us to do stuff. It gives us, um, it's like an energy, I don't know how to explain it, but it, it helps you to do stuff in a very powerful way. Now verse 3, the divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness all things that pertains to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called to us to his own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises which are in the word so that 
through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. We have to become holy as he is holy. Now, it continues in 2 Peter 1 verse 5 to 8. And now this is the process. Because this is done by spending time with Jesus daily. And it tells us how to do it in the this, in this scripture further on. But this is also the process, how you get to have the nature of God. So for this very reason, adding your diligence to the divine promises. Employ every effort in exercising your faith to develop virtue, excellence, resolution, Christian energy, and in exercising virtue, develop knowledge, which is intelligence, and in exercising knowledge, develop self-control, and in exercising self-control, develop steadfastness, patience, and endurance, and in exercising steadfastness, develop godliness. And in exercising godliness, develop brotherly affection. And in exercising brotherly affection, develop Christian love. For as these qualities are yours and increasingly abound in you, they will keep you from being idle or unfruitful until the full personal knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. So you know the first thing it says there, giving all diligence now you know I don't know about you but I if I put my mind to something I do it with diligence if I have to study I do it with diligence if you have a business you do it with diligence if you are training for a marathon you do it with diligence but we don't attend to the Word of God with diligence we do everything else with diligence but we don't do that with diligence so for us to become partakers of the nature of Christ, we have to be diligent in what we do. We are called sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father. So we've got to apply diligence. That's the first thing that we should do. A diligence to what? Now this is a mixed with our faith. Jody, if you will just keep that scripture there. To, to add to your faith all these virtues means that we take these virtues and faith and we take it hand in hand. That's what the Hebrew word says or the Greek word for this scripture. So the first virtue there says adding your diligence to the divine promise. Employ every effort in exercising your faith to develop virtue. So virtue means behavior showing high moral standards. So that's the first thing. Then, after that, knowledge. When God starts to form his nature in you, you, be you began, I know Stefan, uh, uh, that's the first thing I saw with him when he, when he started to change. <laughs> is that he couldn't watch movies anymore where they were stuff in, where they would use Jesus' name or where they would shoot one another dead or where there were moral things that were not right. Um, and we, Simone, I always used to say, nothing in the movie is wrong, but the moment Stefan walks in, then they swear or they do stuff that day and then we have to put off the movie and then we would all be uncomfortable because he's there and we know he doesn't stand for it. So that's the first thing is morality. You, you don't, you walk in the right way. The next thing is knowledge. You start to get knowledge about God, what he's about, his word, how it works, everything else. The third thing is self-control. Now, self-control is one of the fruit of the Spirit. Now, I believe that the nature of God is the fruit of Spirit. Because Moses, um, that's the most beautiful scripture for me. Moses said in Exodus 34, verse 5 to 7, Moses didn't want to go ahead. And he said, 
um, to, to the father. He said, Father, if you do not go from, with us from here, just leave us where we are. And then uh, God said to, um, because Moses was a friend of God, uh, God called Moses a friend. And then God said to the, now the Lord ascended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before me, for him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, God, merciful and gracious. This is our God. Merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin, but will by no means clear the guilty. So this is the God. He's kind. He is long-suffering, so he hang in there with us. I mean, I don't know about you, but I, God must have given up if you hadn't had patience with me, I don't know where I would have been in life. So we've got a God, and we've got to know that about him. How do you trust someone you don't know? How do you trust your children who are sick, and the doctors say that they're going to die? How do you trust your child to someone you don't know? You can't trust that person. But if you know Jesus, if you know the Father and you know he's kind and he's good and he wants the best for you, but you know he's holy, that if I do the, right, the wrong stuff, he cannot have, he, he distance himself from me, then I can trust him. Then I can say to him, Father, this is my child. Please take care of my child because I know you will. I know you I know you. The, the, the second thing, or, or um, another of the virtues is perseverance. When things get tough, you know, so now someone is sick and we pray for healing. And now we're not healed instantly, for example. Some are healed instantly, some are not. Some, sometimes we have to persevere. But do you know that perseverance causes maturity? And do you know that creation is in travail for the mature sons of God? Trava creation is crying out for the mature sons of God. So we've got to persevere. There will be times where life is not easy and the answer is not quick. And where you have to stand and to stand and to stand. But then God comes through for us. And you persevered and you are more mature. Then the next thing is godliness. So these are the steps. That is what happens to us when we become and spend time knowing Jesus, godliness. We are being conform conforming to the character of God. Suddenly you've got patience. You know the best thing that you can do is to look to another person through the eyes of Jesus. If you are able to do that, you don't see their faults and their mistakes. You've got grace for them. And you could love them. Then the next thing is brotherly kindness. And that's the love that we have for fellow Christians. And then the last thing, agape. Agape is the total pinnacle of love. That is what Jesus has for us when he laid down his life for us. So this is the process, what happens to us. We are being transformed into the image and the likeness of God. In James 1 verse 2 to 4, it says, Consider it wholly joyful, my brethren, where you are enveloped in our encounter or encounter trials of any sort or fall into various temptations. Be assured and understand that the trial and the proving of your faith bring out endurance and steadfastness and patience. But let the endurance and steadfastness and patience have full play and do its thorough work so that you may be people perfectly and fully develop, developed with no defects, la lacking in nothing. Uh, William preached that we should stay in the vine. 
You know, and that's the last thing, my time is out, I want to say. To just be saved, it's great. But in Hebrews it says, there's some of you that are still drinking milk and you are supposed to be eating meat. You have to be diligent in your relationship with the Father. You have to be diligent. You have to spend time with Him. Your purpose is not to get rich, to gain whatever you can on this earth, to be a happy chappy here on earth. Your purpose and the total fulfillment of who you are is to become like Jesus. He's not coming for a bride that is blemished. He's coming for himself, for what he intended in the beginning. So that's what we have to do. We have to walk the line. So now I'm saved. What do I do? I start to put diligence in some of the virtues, in spending time with the Lord. And he's faithful. He will take and he will complete the work that's in you. But you have to say, yes, Lord, I want it. Yes, Lord, I want to know you. Lord Jesus, I want to know you. Because if I know you, the world can be, there can be wars, rumors of wars. Everything that's going on on this earth can happen. But I'll be okay. Because I know you. I know my creator. I know my king. And I know he's for me. Who can stand against me? He did everything on the cross. He won everything. There's nothing on this earth that you and I cannot overcome in Him. Nothing. Because it's done. That's all I have to say. I pray. It is my prayer. And if you all stand with me this morning. Lord Jesus, as we come this morning, Holy Spirit, Father, I pray that it will be our heart's desire to know you, Lord Jesus, that when we see you at the judgment, that you will not say, I do not know you. Lord, because you said in your word in John, this is eternal life, that you will know me and my Father. The personal, intimate knowledge So, if you want to know the Father and Jesus Christ, will you just reach out your hands? Holy Spirit, I pray that you will move amongst us, Lord, and that you will minister for us. Lord Jesus, and we ask that we may know you and that we will be transformed into your image and your likeness as your representatives on this earth so that we can advance your kingdom. Thank you, Lord, that you loved us, Father, so much that you you gave it your all. And thank you that this is not a heavy thing, Lord Jesus, because you are the total fulfillment of what we are. And that we can say, like Paul said, doesn't matter where I am at, whether I have or not have, I am happy, I'm content, and I have the joyous privilege of knowing my Lord and my Savior, my provider, my comforter, my defense. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.